And it may or may not be irrational optimism, but Japan has resumed nuclear energy production this past week, starting up the first reactor to operate since last year's tsunami-triggered meltdown at the Fukushima plant. Before that, Japan got one-third of its electricity from nuclear plants, and now the government says it wants to have more of the country's 50 working reactors, or the reactors which were working until Fukushima, restarted as soon as possible. This at the same time, though, as a report which says the Fukushima disaster was man-made and preventable. The report by a parliamentary investigative commission blamed collusion between government regulators and the utility itself for lax precautions. And indeed, there is considerable opposition in Japan to the restarts. Arnie Gunderson worked in the U.S. nuclear power industry for 40 years. Now he is a consultant and engineer with Fairwinds Energy Education. He studied the Fukushima crisis. He wrote a report on it for Greenpeace. He met with members of the Investigative Commission in Tokyo. And he joins me now. Hello, Arnie. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Presumably you see this Investigative Commission's report as agreeing substantially with the one you did for Greenpeace. Uh, yes, it is. Um, both reports uh, talk about um, what, what, what we call the echo chamber effect or regulatory capture. Um, the, uh, the Japanese took it a step further, though, and they also identified some cultural issues within Japan where... Um, um, accepting higher authority is uh, is expected. I wondered what you thought of that cultural deference to authority identification in the report because some people have criticised it as suggesting that the Fukushima disaster, catastrophe or accident, depending on your point of view, was a peculiarly Japanese thing that the rest of the world doesn't really need to worry about because we haven't got cultural deferences to authority? <laughs> well, th that's an excellent question. Uh, let's clear up the word accident. You can't, we can't call it the Fukushima Dai Daiichi accident anymore. You know, an accident is when a bolt of lightning comes out of the blue, and, and this one was certainly man-made and preventable. Well, I mean, in uh, fact, the, the, the official report done by the Parliamentary Commission calls it a nuclear accident. Yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, but on the broad issue of the, the cultural issue, um, I, I, I don't agree with, uh, with the diet on that. I, I see in every country on the, on the globe uh, a nuclear priesthood, um, a group that um, is insular and um, industry experts working hand-in-glove with um, experts from uh, uh, the regulator to the exclusion of uh, good science being provided by other experts. That, you know, that's what happened in Japan. They had warnings for 20 or more years of a tsunami, um, and yet the, um, the official group uh, refused to acknowledge them. Um, but I could go around the country, uh, around the globe, and, and point to you issues in each country where uh, that same problem exists. So I think the Japanese were a little bit hard on themselves culturally. Also, though, the, the, the reactor number one was built by General Electric and designed by Abasco, both of which are United States firms. So it's, it's hard to blame the Japanese culture when, in fact, the design was all American. But are you blaming the design or the regulation mostly? I am blaming the culture of ignoring independent experts. So I guess that would be, um, I guess that would be regulation. You know, I think at the end of the day, though, it, it boils down to money. Um, if the Japanese had designed for what's really the worst case, the plants would have been so expensive they wouldn't have gotten built. So I think the, the, the priesthood, the people that want to get these plants built, are willing to take risks and lower the price of the plant in order to bring them to market. Had the uh, tsunami walls been put in and the uh, extra earthquake restraints, um, this plant would not ever have been competitive in 1970 or in, in 2010. So you're saying that it was built to be competitive, and in order to be competitive, it could not be safe? Yes. Uh, nuclear power can be safe, but it can't be cheap at that point. 
the key it's, it's, it's definitely a trade off and uh in order to make these plants safe enough they become uh, they price themselves out of the market although Arnie, as as fossil fuels get more expensive as most people anticipate they will then nuclear power will become more affordable will it not um actually nuclear is still going up it's hard to imagine but uh, nuclear costs are still going up and in fact there's been a crossover in the last year worldwide where renewables are now cheaper um, per kilowatt than, uh, than, than nuclear. Uh, but yes, you're right. If we properly priced oil um, and, and, and put in the burdens on the, on the planet in addition to uh, the, the cost to extract it, um, those prices would go up. And in comparison, all the other alternatives, you know, nuclear or, um, or the renewables, um, would become more competitive. And, and frankly, that would actually tilt the, the, the playing field more toward the renewables, even more than it appears to be heading. But clearly you've ruled out nuclear power no matter how safe it's made. It, you know, my, my career, 40 years ago, I, I thought nuclear was going to save the world when I started. Did you really? Um, ni- Yes, I, I was absolutely convinced that it was, uh, I was on a quest. So what, and, uh, what unconvinced you specifically? Well, I, I became a whistleblower inadvertently, of course, in, in 1990. But even then, I was, uh, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, deliberately bought the inspection and took bribes. But even then, I still believed in nuclear. I was just concerned about the regulator. A week, a month before Fukushima, I was saying to people that we should do renewables, we should never do coal or oil, but if that doesn't work, we should do uh, nuclear. And yet Fukushima pushed me over. And I've, I've come to the conclusion that we are just not smart enough, that this is a technology that can destroy a nation, and um, um, to, to entrust that uh, damage potential to to anyone, whether they're benevolent or not, is um, is just outside of the scope of mankind. Given this polarization that you've talked about, uh, whether you are for or against it, and the regulatory capture that you've spoken about, are, there are no independent experts, are there? Everybody has to fight their corner in a way that is more dogmatic than they might ordinarily choose. Is that a fair summary, do you think? Um, I'm reminded of a quote by Rachel Carson. Um, she said, um, uh, she was talking about the chemical industry, but, uh, you know, she said that when experts and industry form these professional societies, when the professional societies talk, who are you hearing, the experts or the, or, or the industry? And I think that the professional societies that consult with government are all um, essentially uh, subsidiaries of the of the industry, so there's very few of us on the uh, willing to speak out um, on the opposite side of that argument. It's um, uh, uh, but yet to me it doesn't. It's not a religion. It's not a Christ and an antichrist, a nuclear and an anti-nuclear. It's about money, and if we make these plants safe enough, we can't afford them. In which case you're saying no nuclear power is good nuclear power, in which case you're as biased as anyone else, including the International Atomic Energy Agency. Well, I like to think of myself as just like Wall Street. Wall, <laughs> Wall, Street, won't, Wall Street won't fund these because it makes no economic sense. Um, you know, the nuclear plants that are... But that big, doesn't, but that doesn't, you know, I'm sorry, Arnie, but in this day and age you cannot use Wall Street as some kind of touchstone of wisdom, right? <laughs> You're probably right. Ah. If, if that's the case, then, um, yeah, I think if we're going to spend the subsidies uh, that nuclear is getting, we'd better spend them on, uh, on, on renewable alternatives. All right. Well, just in a practical sense, is there any way that Japan can continue to do what it's doing by getting its electricity from something other than nuclear plants? The, well, the, the German example is the Germans shut down all their really old plants immediately, and so they shut down about eight plants, and they have 20 or so still running. And they've committed to phasing those 20 out before 2022. 
Um, and, uh, you know, that to me is a, is a, a reasonable plan. Um, shut down the old ones and phase the new ones out over the next 10 years. There's also an economic benefit here. If you figure out how to do that, the first country to figure out how to do that, um, the world is going to be the path to your door um, because, you know, Gorbachev said that uh, it wasn't perestroika that just destroyed the Soviet Union. It was Chernobyl. So I would think that world leaders really don't want to build nuclear plants, but it is the only alternative that's portrayed to them. But, you know, p- there isn't people more, people more pessimistic than you, and I'm talking to one of them later in the program, although he would deny the label pessimistic, says that there's no hope in renewable energy because in order to get renewable energy, you still need to use vast amounts of fossil fuel to produce the hardware. There's no way around it. Yes, you do need some fossil fuel for all of it to, to do the excavation, but the but the net effect of the carbon compared to um, you know what we're what we're putting out per kilowatt now is is much much lower. Um, now I always think that um, you know people say well nuclear produces some fossil fuel it does, but in comparison um, you really can't make that comparison. So I, I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, if we let if we take all the subsidies off the table for nuclear and for fossil, um, we would get a market that would uh, run from nuclear and into alternative smart grids and, and distributed generation and, and things like that. How much real opposition is there in Japan to the restarts? In other words, will the government achieve its goal? You know, the the, the OI plant is, is planned to restart, and they're probably producing electricity as we speak. Yeah. Um, there was uh, 7 million petitioners wrote to the, the Diet asking them not to, and um, uh, approximately 100,000, I've heard numbers lower, I've heard numbers higher, have surrounded the Prime Minister's house every Friday um, in, in protest. Um, but, you know, at the, the Diet report really should be the deal-breaker. The Diet report says that NISA, the, the regulator, um, was in bed with the people that built the plant. That hasn't changed. So the Tokyo Electric, I'm sorry, so the, the Japanese government is moving ahead with the plant despite the fact that at the end of the day it hasn't met any of the, the goals established by the Diet report. And so, short answer, yes or no, will the Japanese government go ahead and resume their reactors? I think they will, and I think at the next election um, they will face the consequences. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Arnie Gunderson, who was, um, as you described it, a whistleblower. He was in the U.S. nuclear power industry for 40 years, and he's now a consultant. An engineer with Fairwinds Energy Education.